So nematodes in general have been models for the study of the control of gene expression during development, and in particular, specifically, this species here, uh, which is known as C. elegans, or Cyanorabidus elegans, a little bit hard to say. I'm sure other people might pronounce that differently. Um, but C. elegans is quite famous as a model organism for developmental biology. Again, it's sort of akin to what Drosophila melanogaster is to genetics. Um, and there's a number of reasons why this is true. The study of C. elegans began in the 60s and has been an important tool of molecular and developmental biologists ever since. One of the things that's true is that um, it's a small worm. It's about one and a half millimeters in length. It contains about 3,000 total cells, uh, about 1,000 somatic cells, and 2,000 germ cells. Remember, germ cells are reproductive cells. So the basic somatic cells of the body um, are roughly a thousand, and as we're going to see, there's actually a specific number that we can count. Okay, uh, because each species of nematode has a structurally and biochemically distinct cuticle, C. elegans uh, uh, definitely has its own distinct cuticle that has been studied quite a bit. Another thing is that it exists either as a hermaphrodite or as a male. Okay, so it can be, again, a hermaphrodite, meaning it's going to have both sexes in the same body, or there are males, okay? But there, you never just see a female, so they either have both or just male reproductive organs. Uh, because of this, um, hermaphrodites can be self-fertilizing as hermaphrodites, but they're also, it's also possible for them, for, for you to be able to do crosses because you can have males of other individuals. So self-fertilization would always result in genetically identical individuals. But if you want to cross them, you take males of a different individual and, and cross it with the hermaphrodite. And this way you can um, get re recessive mutations and, and do crosses. Another feature is that their bodies are transparent. So it is possible to be able to see through the body and just follow what's going on here. And that has allowed people to do all kinds of studies and to literally follow the development of every somatic cell in the worm using differential interference microscopy. So I'm going to just uh, try to move this out of the way a little bit so I can write a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about the fact that C. elegans has a very rigid developmental pattern. It kind of, you start out with an egg that becomes fertilized and after a number of cleavages it, uh, the fertilized egg develops into a larvae and at about 558 cells uh, the larvae forms inside of uh, an egg case. Okay, so it's still in the in the egg case. Alright, and then what happens is it will hatch out after that. So exactly at exactly 558 cells it hatches out of the egg case and then it will continue with more cell divisions until it reaches uh, an adult worm at 959 cells. So there's exactly 959 somatic cells in the worm which is really really fascinating. Um, it does continue to grow, but not by cell division after that. So after that, um, it increases in size by increasing cell sizes. So the cells actually get larger until the whole body reaches a maximum size of about one and a half millimeters, and that's your adult worm. So it's really pretty interesting that you have this constant number of cells. Again, this is what we refer to as U-Telly. All right, and different species of nematodes are going to have a different number of cells. And for C. elegans, it's 959. So the lineages of each somatic cell can be traced back to a single cell in this small group of cells that are called stem cells. Okay, and these are the stem cells over here. 
the AB and the ABA, and so this is um, anterior and posterior. That's where these A's and P's come from. And so at any rate, these stem cells eventually, after many more cell divisions and such, give rise to these particular structures like um, neurons and the epidermis and part of the pharynx, and here's the mesodermal pharynx, and there's part of the gut and the epidermis and then the germline. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting that the cell lineages can be followed and that a lot of work led up to the ability to be able to do that. In addition, many scientists have looked at which genes are actually involved in the control of developmental decisions. And as you might imagine, um, and we've learned about before, homeobax genes are responsible for regulating those sets of genes that may determine the control of development in particular cell lineages. Okay, so... Um, and some of the things that they figured out is that m most cells are actually regulated through their own internal program, but there's a few examples of something that's called induction, where the differentiation of a cell is influenced by a neighboring cell. And all of this work, when you say, well, who cares about these little nematodes? But all of this work has actually been very useful for studies of aging and looking particularly at uh, program cell death and the genes that are involved in developmental timing and when does the end of the life of a cell happen. So it's really pretty fascinating work. So as I mentioned earlier, um, many nematodes are free living, including C. elegans and uh, a lot of the other ones that I mentioned generally. Uh, but I want to spend a little time talking about those that uh, are parasitic because there are some very important human parasites that are nematodes and I'd like to just spend a little time. So um, this parasite, this nematode that causes a disease called elephantiasis is uh, just one example. And functionally, structurally, these worms don't look uh, terribly different from each other. If you can imagine when you look in lab at the little uh, vinegar eels, or you can even uh, just run a YouTube video for vinegar eel and watch their little sinusoidal motion. If you could imagine those kinds of little worms that uh, live in the lymph tissue of uh, human beings and the kinds of influences that might have. So I want to just um, I just want to put out a little bit of a uh, warning for the next number of slides that I'm going to show because some of them are pretty disturbing. I'm going to show some pictures of people that are suffering from various conditions that are caused by nematodes and uh, the first one I'm going to show are this uh, elephantiasis. And you may have heard of a movie called The Elephant Man. Uh, who actually had a disease that was different than, uh, than this particular uh, disease, which is caused by a nematode. So brace yourself, here we go. When these kinds of worms, often referred to as filarial worms, um, get lodged in the lymphatic system and block the lymph fluid from being able to flow normally and drain, uh, it can back up and, and cause uh, super enlargements of limbs. And especially for people living in uh, less developed countries where they don't have access to clean food and clean water and proper shelter, um, certainly the access to medical care is, is even worse. These same worms can definitely uh, affect the scrotum in males as well. On this slide, you can see a blood smear, one of the ways that uh, you can identify uh, the disease before it gets this bad is to do a blood smear and look for the organism in a, uh, in a blood smear. And, and clearly you can see the filarial worm right there. There's another uh, horrible parasite referred to as Loa Loa, or the eye worm, uh, which you can found in, as it says here, tissues in any part of the body, subcutaneous tissues. Uh, and particularly, it's known for uh, being visible in the conjunctiva of the eye. So you can actually see the worm, kind of tracing the worm here in this person's eyeball. And um, this, uh, as it says here, is... Uh, is, is carried by this uh, fly vector.